with offices in Dublin, New York, and London. Gate One sponsor the Innovation Show. Gate One are experts in transformation and change, working with some of the world's leading organizations to drive meaningful change. You can find Gate One at gateoneconsulting.com. Our guests' experience working with mid-size and large legacy firms has shown that innovation is as much about leadership as it is about the method, the strategy, the organization, and the culture. Leaders that ignite and sustain a spirit of exploration are more likely to succeed than those that rely on past strengths or success formulas to carry them through. At the center of every story of all corporate innovations, are people called corporate explorers, whose interest and intense curiosity makes them dare to go where others do not. These are the leaders capable of closing the gap between knowing what needs to be done to grow new businesses and doing so. Today's book is 20 years in the making. It started when our guest attended an IBM Strategic Leadership Forum at Harvard Business School, led by our previous wonderful guests in this series, Michael Tushman and Charles O'Reilly III. Mike and Charles were engaged to support IBM's Emerging Business Opportunity, EBO program, as the guys mentioned in Episode 3. Our guest had just joined IBM from McKinsey and was assigned as an internal consultant charged with supporting these nascent businesses. You'll find out he is a corporate explorer. We are about to hear that story and so much more. It is a pleasure to welcome, finally, this has been a long, long time coming, the author of The Corporate Explorer, How Corporations Beat Startups at the Innovation Game, Andrew Bins. Welcome to the show. Hi, Aidan. Fabulous to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's so great to finally have you with us. And I want to point out, I, I said this about Charles, I claimed him as an Irish man, but that, Andy, you're a Welshman. I'm a Welshman. So that's important to point out. Through and through, my heart sank as we were crushed by the Irish uh, in the recent Six Nations. So, you know, <laughs> we'll get our own back one day. Well, you, you've did it for years beforehand, so I think we're only kind of <laughs> starting to level the playing field. In the previous books written by both Charles and Mike, they talked about the leadership and the structures and the culture, etc. But these are those people, you couldn't have written a better book for the listener of this show. These are the people who are in the trenches trying to drive from within and meet and encounter so many obstacles on their way up the track. And oftentimes they stumble towards the success. And as we'll find out, maybe we'll talk about the very end of today's show, is even when they reach that point of success, there's still another few steps to go. I I often think about it, Andy, as a Disneyland queue. You think you're at the top, and then there's a few more (laughs) little corners you have to go around. But but maybe we'll talk about the the goal of this book and indeed the structure, because the book is laid out in a certain way. So I think the 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 fascinating thing, Aidan is that when we look at uh, a startup, uh, uh, you know, VC-backed company, we immediately go to the entrepreneur. It's all about Steve Jobs. It's all about um, Bezos or, or Musk. Um, and, and yet when it's corporate innovation, we're like, no, no, no. It's all about the structure and the process and the rest of it. How come, right? And what happens uh, is when you peel it back, it's really just not the story. Yeah, yeah, we can talk about structure and process and so on, and they play a role. But just as in a venture-backed startup, every instance of successful corporate innovation, taking a business into a new domain, building a new venture, there's a corporate explorer behind it. And uh, it, it once you sit with these people and hear their story, it's obvious. And it, and it became obvious to me, it kind of pulled everything together. I was sitting in Vienna with uh, this man I'd heard about who was building a venture inside one of uh, our clients. And he sat there and he told me his story about how he'd had an observation about how the insurance industry was broken. And he wanted to figure out how to reinvent some of the the community sharing spirit that existed uh, at its foundation. 
and how he had spent five years developing this idea. And I, I, that's what he is. This is not, th this is the same sort of entrepreneurship that you see in the startup. It's just expressed in the corporate world. And it kind of brought together for me the realization that that is, that is who we're dealing with. Firstly, the idea of focusing a book on this person is so important. And it is, I mean, there's so much in the book. And I thought the way to show our audience how much is in it, because there's no way we'll do it justice, even in multiple sessions. And we do intend to do a session today talking about the structure, but then show corporate explorers in action as well with a few special guests in as part of this series. They're coming up soon. But let's talk about the structure of the book, because it goes through a very formulaic approach, which is really important, I think, for many corporate explorers, because oftentimes we stumble because we're really like an entrepreneur. We're trying to figure it out as we go, which has its merits. But this structure is so, so useful. Maybe you'll talk to this at a high level, Andy. Yeah, but certainly. Um, so strategic ambition is really about that that license to the explorer, right? Um, and it's, it's to be fair, not every corporate explorer has the benefit of um, a CEO or senior team that really states this. Many have to figure it out for themselves. But the, the, the best example, in my view, uh, of this strategic ambition thought is uh, Ajay Banga when he was CEO of MasterCard. And, and he said, our job at MasterCard is to kill cash, right? And we want to wage a war on cash and convert as many transactions to digital as we can. And what's interesting about this is that, is that he firstly creates this emotional connection, right, with that ambition. But he has also um, uh, redefined the business because up till then, uh, MasterCard was only about credit card processing. It was actually kind of a, a small piece of the financial services industry and payments industry. And he says, no, we want to have digital solutions that will attack all of these parts of payments. Right? And uh, I, I know that today, when he, in 2012, 2013, when he said this, um, that 85% that of the globe's transactions were in cash. And his mission was to reduce that, right? So he gave it a quantified uh, point as well. Or uh, Mary Barra at GM, you know, 35%, so sorry, by 2035, we will sell, you know, only uh, zero emission vehicles, right? Clear, compelling, strategic ambition uh, of where the firm is headed, and what it means to achieve it. And and that that creates this license. It says to people, you have the ability um, to go and to explore, uh, and and that's a, a sort of a mission that these corporate explorers take up uh, and then develop their their own expression of, which is a, sort of a passionate commitment uh, to solving a customer problem. The 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 uh, uh, the example I, I shared a moment ago about. Um, the, the the gentleman in the insurance industry. This was Christian Curtis, um, and and Christian just has a passion to solve the problem of insurance customers having to deal with insurance companies who, for the most part, have become more wedded to catching their customers at theft um, on fraud claims than they have to serving them as being you know important uh, individuals with you know real needs to to to, to serve so that there's, there's this combination at one level the corporate level this ambition for the corporation at the explorer level this passion for the customer the sort of the realization of that dream uh, close to the customers then the disciplines uh, are, are about how do you how do you realize that how do you make that happen and this is true whether you are in a corporate or in a startup. It's essentially the same. How do you generate ideas that solve the customer problem? How do you incubate, do the test and learn experimentation to find out if your solution actually uh, satisfies the customer, that you can get it to market, you understand the pricing, all the rest of it? And then can you scale it? And one of the things that's interesting here is why would you do this inside a corporate? Why would you idea incubate and scale inside of a corporate? Because surely 
uh, the startup has an advantage, and that's everybody's assumption. And, and in ideation and incubation, there are reasons to believe that startups do have it easier, and we can talk more about that. But when it comes to scale, that's the thing. That's the thing that corporates have that startups don't, because they already have customers. They already have capabilities and capacity to be able to scale a venture. And it just takes, how do you use them? Well, how do you use them then links the ambidextrous organization? Because as soon as you say, I'm going to leverage some part of what the existing organization has, you've got to figure out how to deal with the need to be separate, we know that large, successful organizations are, for the most part, going to kill small, nascent, uncertain ventures, right? So you need a little autonomy from um, the core business in order to survive. But you also need access, and it's the access through which you're able to leverage those uh, assets um, to make things happen. And so another example of successful corporate explorer is Deborah DeSanza at, at Best Buy, the uh, American retail chain. And Deborah has created this Best Buy Health, and she's done it by leveraging assets like what they call their geek squad. And this is the army of people that go and do home theater installation. Well, she's trained them in empathy skills and has them doing um, health uh, installation to help people to do remote monitoring of patients at home so they can get them out of hospital quickly, right? Uh, and so she's leveraged this and she has a way of making sure inside the organization that yes, she's autonomous, she's separate from the main business, but she can still reach in and leverage Geek Squad, leverage other assets that Best Buy has in order to set herself on her uh, on her growth trajectory. And then this, this notion of explore leadership, because if you're doing all of what I just described, you're going to run into some issues. The biggest issue you're going to run into is what I call silent killers. And if you've spoken to Charles, this is just another way of saying culture, right? Uh, and the culture of the established core business is defend what we've always done the way we do things around here. Most businesses have a sort of a, a professionally rooted um, a set of competences that drive a lot of their norms and uh, and assumptions um, uh, that they optimize for the short term, sometimes for quarterly pressure, but also because even in a private company, um, because there is a material reality to uh, a business result, and you know the, uh, a new venture is a little bit less certain and uh, therefore more vulnerable. Uh, and then finally, and critically. In a large organization, people maximize comfort. You know, there is a, uh, a, a level to which we want to maintain harmony. Uh, and therefore, part of what ventures face as a, as a challenge is that they are the, the upstarts um, and they're disrupting uh, the, concept, the easy consensus. And so that sort of reality of what you're facing means that if you are a corporate explorer and you are innovating, ideating, incubation and scaling, you're also a leader of change. And you've got to be just as capable at building a social network inside your organization so that when it comes to advocate uh, for your venture, you're in a position um, to be able to sort of neutralize some of those silent killers. And, 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 and you also need leaders who are willing to commit to you. And this is this notion of readiness to act that at some level, uh, there will always be the need for somebody who's ready to step into um, the uh, maybe less unknown than it was when you started, but still there's risks. And so you do need somebody who's willing to commit resources from the firm to scale. And so these sort of four pillars, if you will, of the, the life of the corporate explorer um, explain a lot of their success. I think it's important to give the overview because there's so much in the book and it does really bring to life so much of the th uh, elements we talked about in previous episodes. I wanted to lean into some of the, the personal challenges for the corporate explorer, though, because oftentimes we don't get to talk about it. And you've experienced this yourself with IBM, where so many times you have to become like a politician. You have to go and uh, you talked about that social network from within the organization, but you need to win sponsorship, 
from other stakeholders before you even engage the CEO. This is difficult stuff for the corporate explorer because it's not in your core repertoire. And this is why so many corporate explorers often seem a bit random having meetings here, there and everywhere outside the organization, within the organization. And sometimes they get kind of labeled as a bit random. And this is the reason why. And I, I really wanted to emphasize this for our audience because it can be lonely and you can feel somewhat ostracized. And in a way, the organization sometimes does gaslight you and make you feel like you're the problem. So maybe we'll talk a little bit about that element of building a network, building support network within and outside the organization. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really great place to to focus because it is um, the piece that 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 uh, often explains the difference between success and failure. Right. Um, so let me see if I can contrast this a little bit. So recently, a friend of mine locally to where I live here in uh, in Massachusetts uh, introduced me to his former CEO in a startup venture, uh, and. Uh, what I hadn't realized is that they'd actually spun out of another company. They tried to build this business internally and they were unsuccessful and they spun it out. And as I spoke to this really amazing um, uh, guy, uh, he told me about how they had pursued it when they were inside the corporation. And he said, yeah, we were very careful to keep them out. We actually made sure that our door into our venture had card reader access that nobody else in the company was able to get in the, in the door. How did that affect your relationships with them? Um, well, that was okay because we didn't want any relationships with them. Right? Uh, but I don't know why they why they uh, they didn't want our uh, innovation. It's brilliant. All right. hmm. The other side of it is um, Christian Curtis or or another leader that um, we could uh, talk about, Balaji Bondili uh, at uh, the professional services firm uh, Deloitte. And um, Balaji uh, is extraordinary for the patient way in which he has built support inside Deloitte for his innovation, which is Deloitte Pixel. And and if you, uh, and Mike Tushman has done a case on this, and we can listen to the different leaders in Deloitte talking about this. And he goes individual by individual conversations winning over their support, getting permission to do trials, to to bring Pixel in front of the customers. And over a period of time, what he's doing is he's building allies, people who understand what he's trying to get done and will make available to him the opportunities he needs in order to advance the venture. And what's remarkable about Balaji or Christian Kurtish uh, uh, at, at, uh, at Unica uh, it is is that they, they do this with remarkably low ego. This is not about them. So, so when when uh, working at Unica, I would then talk to other uh, leaders uh, in the business, and uh, they would say, "Oh yes, uh, Sharisk, uh, Christian, yeah, very, I I helped him get started. You know, I, I did what was needed in order to help him uh, get started, and he managed to make a dozen people feel." that they were responsible for his success. That's what made him (laughs) successful, is that ability to make others feel a part of it, and it's not all about him. And this is a big contrast between the entrepreneur and the corporate explorer, right? Is that that, that sort of uh, uh, low ego. It's not as if Christian or Balaji don't have pride in what they do or or, or have needs that, that are being met. It's just that they don't need to be for... You know, right in the front and the center uh, of every conversation. Uh, it's about the idea. It's about the business. It's not necessarily just about that. I have a saying. I, I read this brilliant book. He was a guest on the show in its early iteration, a guy called Jeffrey J. Fox from your part of the world. He's in New Jersey. And he, he wrote all these books about rainmaking. So how to be a great salesperson. And one of the titles was be a credit maker, not a credit taker. And when I read about it, I was like kind of going, I failed at that in the organization I was in where I was a corporate explorer because the culture was one where it was dog eat dog and you needed to take credit for your successes. So I think it's such an important aspect to be able to 
make other people the hero, including most importantly, your own boss. I think that's a really key one. You need to make your boss. And if there's other silos or departments involved, each person involved in that make them the hero as well. This is such an important thing. But I'm going to link it to a, a brilliant line you wrote. You said, corporate explorers challenge the basic rules of the business of which they are a part. Most do this from a position of weakness. They have no revenue nor customer base. They are, in fact, a cost to the company. They trade not on fact, but on belief that they can create something new. This is a lonely position to occupy. Many corporate explorers have no peers inside the company, and at least at first, most have no team. That is such a key line because so many people feel psychologically bullied, like I said, or ostracized. So you really do need a tough skin to do this. You did this yourself in IBM. And indeed, your colleague, Carl Kovach did this as well. This understanding of how to manage that is in between the lines of the corporate explorer. Sometimes talk, you talk about it explicitly, but something I thought we'd shine a little light on. There is this need for resilience, right? For um, th this is why I think that this, um, this passion for solving a customer problem is so important. And again, somewhat similar to the, the, the entrepreneur um, uh, side as well, is that you need a source of strength. <laughs> you need to really know that what you're working on has uh, validity, that you, you know, that at some level with all the learning and testing and experimentation, you're right, right? You know, that there's something there. Um, Carol is an extraordinary woman, uh, now raises goats in Ohio, um, but, 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 you know, a, a brilliant executive and scientist. And uh, I remember vividly being with her one day uh, in um, the uh, then IBM headquarters in, um, in Somers, New York. And uh, she was, we were wrestling with how do we get one of the senior vice presidents of the business units of IBM um, to take her seriously? Because, you know, she was at that point, I think probably um, 30 people by then. Um, and this was the guy who ran the main IBM services unit um, of, you know, several hundred thousand, right? you know, and, 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 you know, most of the companies, um, um, you know, probably 50 billion of revenue, you know, it's, it's a slight imbalance of power between these two individuals. And uh, she was explaining how he wouldn't do what she wanted him to. And I said, you know, Carol, you may have to compromise. And at the time she was, she was playing with a pencil and she just snapped the pencil in two. I hate compromise. right? <laughs> and and that the, the, she just has this intensity to her. And so underneath the, um, uh, the willingness to let others be the winner, let others take the credit, all of this, there has to be some resilience, some passion, some commitment um, to what you're doing. And I think that uh, that, that, is, that is a part of these stories uh, a, 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 as well. Um, I have to say that, and it's funny, the people who've been involved in these corporate exploring stories it, it can be the most important moments in their career. Many of them go on, like, so another uh, corporate explorer I, uh, I, I talk about in the book is Jim Peck at LexisNexis, right? Jim Peck has now been a CEO three times, right? He's CEO now of um, a, a Nielsen, you know, market research company. I can't remember what they call it. Is it Nielsen IQ? And, and, and 20 years ago when I've, you know, first knew him, he, he was he was creating this venture that had no revenue at all, right? And he again had been the person who'd seen the insight and managed to work his way through a couple of layers of management to get attention to the possibility of creating a risk analytics business for LexisNexis, and uh, and he's moved on now. But when you talk to Jim, as I did for the book, you talk to Jim about that time. It's just, it's a magnificent time moment in his career when everything came together. Um, and I still have um, friends from the IBM Life Sciences team. I've been working with um, one of the most important people in that story, Dr. 
uh, Jamie Coffin, uh, who's now at a, a, this biotech in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, that I was uh, with last week. And 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 for, for the bond between me and Jim and, and Jamie is is unbreakable because of that moment uh, of being involved in creating the IBM Life Sciences business. So it's just like the, the, the case of being a, a, an entrepreneur in that regard as well, um, because you are a little bit of us versus them. You are the 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 the, the little fish swimming in that direction when the shawl is all going the other way. Uh, and that builds a lot of uh, res resilience, but you've got to make sure that you don't make it so um, strong an identity that you reject people, uh, as I was saying earlier. I'm going to jump around the place now based on what you said, because I, I deeply studied the book. So you've you sparked this thought to me, which is, okay, you mentioned Balaji. And, and by the way, just for our audience, we're going to do a series, we're going to do an episode with Balaji and Andy, so we're going to talk about the corporate explorer in the field, as uh, so to speak. But I thought about how you mentioned about how good that feels. And many people will just kind of go, yeah, yeah, couldn't couldn't be bothered with that. Show me the money. And one of the things I find and having been a corporate explorer is it it isn't about the money. It's about this curiosity or a series of traits that many many corporate explorers have they're deeply interested in the world they read widely so very eclectic reading habits they read papers they're interested in loads loads of different things and it's that desire often to create something from all this content that's marinating in their heads that they want some type of output that's actually what is often there but let's use it as a way to talk about for the organization, because many CEOs listen to the show, Andy, and they're kind of going, okay, how do I incentivize people in my organization to even do this? And you talk in the book about four various types of compensation or carrot to try and create this idea of explore within the exploit organization. Yeah, so we talk about the different ways in which people think about uh, compensating and, and it's quite common to say, well, I'm going to need some uh, internal ventures. We better set up something that would allow uh, our explorers um, to uh, earn as much uh, as uh, a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, right? Let's give them some shadow stock, perhaps, that is pegged to uh, an independent uh, external valuation of the venture that they create. And at Intel at one point, I think they may still do this as well, um, they even give... Um, the uh, venture leader, the opportunity to spin the, the venture out of the company or to have a business unit leader buy it back uh, into, the, uh, in, into the business. And the, the difficulty with this um, is that it creates a kind of a perverse incentive. You've just said, I want new ventures for this firm, but oh, Mr. Corporate or Ms. Corporate Explorer, your best route to get rich is to take it out. And okay, it might create some, some uh, enterprise value and you, you get some, um, you, you know, something from the transaction, but you've lost <laughs> all of the opportunity that it might bring back to your firm by way of revenue growth, but more importantly, potentially, um, the capabilities to, 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 to build, um, you know, for the future. And, and so there's this kind of disconnect. And the other perversity is the way that, um, you know, it's, it's Cisco experienced this, uh, of where you can end up having, you know, billionaires sitting next to regular employees. And then unsurprisingly, there's a little tension uh, 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 around that, right? And jealousy. And so you've broken something important about your corporate culture when you do it as well. And it turns out it's not needed. There is no evidence that incentives make a significant difference to the choices that corporate explorers make. Right? This is not investment banking. It's not venture capital. It's not the world of the entrepreneur. The most successful corporate explorers are long-term insiders who have a deep passion to solve a customer problem and have a strong social network so that they are trusted to step forward and to do something um, that is a little unexpected and out of the ordinary. Sometimes they're mavericks. Sometimes they never quite fit in the firm. That um, would be true of, of, of Carol Kovac when 
we've been on panel discussions together and I would say that she'd hit me, but, you know, she, she was a little bit of, 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 of a maverick and, and that is true of, of many of them. Maybe unpopular with some, but they have enough of a social network that they're known because the other part of this, uh, Aiden, is that um, whenever you have a new venture, it is going to go through many years of, you know, up and down, up and down, right? It's good. And the whole point of incubation is to face many points of failure. You know, I, I, I don't subscribe to the fail fast. I've, I've, I don't think we'd ever, you're never seeking failure. What you're seeking is learning, right? And those learnings can, can be, oh boy, we don't know what we're doing. They can be really tough moments. And so uh, when you're a CEO uh, or a, a sponsor of this kind of venture, you're going to look at that and say, is it that we're learning or is it that you don't know what you're doing? Right. And if it's somebody you've hired in from the outside, you're much more quickly going to go to the uh, conclusion that it's about the person you hired because you've, they've got no track record. They've got no thing for you to judge them in the past. Whereas if it's an insider, you say, well, Aiden's done well for us in the past and he's honest and we trust what he has to tell us. And so if he's telling us we're learning and that things are moving forward, I've got some basis to believe that this may be true. And so what we see when we look at these cases of success is that for the most part, they don't have any special incentives. But what they do have is passion and they do have this strong social network. Now, do I think that that's, what I would advocate and what I advocate to, to our clients to change logic. No, I, I think giving, giving corporate explorers some upside based on a long-term incentive plan, I think that's reasonable. Just don't make it so perverse that it creates jealousy and unfairness inside uh, the organization. So you mentioned at the start, Andy, about, about sport. So I, I often think about how sport reflects business world so many times, you know, and one of the ways it does is, sometimes you need a coach to give you a chance that's how many so many players in any sport in any field got their chance was some coach somewhere decided you know what i like this kid i'm going to give them a, an opportunity and sometimes if that's in an existing team that coach also fa faces some type of backlash from maybe an angry parent or somebody in the backroom staff who doesn't think it's the right decision and it's the same goes for corporate explorers. They need somebody to help them. I certainly had this when I got a chance after my career in rugby. The CEO at the time, a guy called Paddy Halpenny, he gave me a chance. He said, here, you, you run with this. Give it a go. See how it works. And that blessing was so, so important. And there's a person you talk about this, another Irishman, I have to add, analog devices, Vince Roach a $90 billion market cap technology firm. And since becoming CEO in 2013, he has led a remarkable growth story. I'd love you to tell him, tell us a little bit about him and about his ambition and how he's done it. Yeah, yeah, delighted to do so. Vince, Vince Roche is a remarkable character and, and one that um, Ireland should be very proud of. I think that um, uh, he's uh, the uh, Irishman that, the, the CEO of the largest corporation, you know, globally, um, and uh, and and he's he's he is a, a, a an extraordinary leader who I've had the privilege to work with from um, just before he was CEO. So I've been able to follow this journey uh, personally uh, all the way through. And 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 when I started with him, uh, this was a firm of uh, around two billion uh, of of revenue. Um, and uh, it's now a firm of, I think, 12 or 13 billion of revenue. And, uh, and as, as you say, 90 billion uh, of, of market cap. And, and, and Vince has grown this firm with a very clear uh, intent. And, and from the beginning, his uh, goal was, I want to, uh, yeah, we are, we are rightly famous around the world for they, they create uh, semiconductors that that trans uh, translate the physical world into the digital, and so many people have not heard of analog devices, but almost everybody uses their products the whole time, right? Uh, they're in manufacturing, they're in cars, they're in health, uh, they're all over the all over the place because there's constant need to translate these signals. 
But the thing is that um, he perceived that, well, perceived two things. Firstly, that um, uh, they um, th th there's there's new ways of dealing with this physical to digital world, right? Um, that now you can put data in the cloud and to analyze data you've collected and then bring it back closer to you to, to make decisions in this sort of internet of things, uh, or now we call it edge computing um, um, uh, vision. Uh, and then also notice that uh, other people were earning most of the money on this, right? That uh, actually it was the Googles and the Apples and the Facebooks and the software companies who were ca capturing most of the value. And, and Vince's vision was, I want to move up the stack. I want to have solutions that are more valuable to my customers, that solve problems for them, that have consequence so that we can get paid more as a consequence. We can earn more of that value ourselves. And so this created this license to explore um, for the company and allowed him to create a number of different ventures, one of which that I feature in the book uh, is um, condition-based monitoring for machines. So they, they, they develop um, a sensor that you put on the slap on the side of a motor and just by sensing the vibration of the motor they can analyze those data and tell a manufacturing plant when the motor is going to break right uh, and what was fascinating was how quickly they were able uh, in their testing of this to figure out what the signature was uh, for breakage and so what what they did is not only then sell this um, this um, uh, this sensor, but then they completely changed their business model. You know, the, traditionally, semiconductors work through procurement and they, um, they bid on contracts to provide a circuit to go into a new product. Well, the, the, these guys did two things. Firstly, with this, with this sensor that you slap on the side, they, um, they set up an e-commerce channel and uh, they're selling to distributors who use this product themselves. And all you do is you buy the sensor and you spin it up online and you've got, you, you know, they, they don't need to go through procurement or anything. The other thing which was critical is because they've become so much more valuable to customers that they have relationships in the C-suite um, that previously no semiconductor company other than maybe Intel would have, right? And so they've changed the whole dynamic around their business in terms of who they speak to, what they're um, responsible for inside the company, the sort of the strategic value and importance of the company. And this, this makes something, uh, this makes a really important point, Aiden, which is that part of why you do new ventures, part of why you need corporate explorers is not only because of the revenue that their businesses generate. The, the revenue from this condition-based monitoring thing will be relatively small for some time. And it's, it's growing. It's available in, I think, 90 countries. But, but, the, the point is that it taught them about how to live into the future. It taught them something that was important to the rest of their business. And there are a number of places, some of which I can't talk about uh, yet, where, where analog devices is leveraging those insights about how do you take data to the cloud, apply algorithms in order to solve problems of importance to different industries. And that's the thing that they learned that they've used to build their business. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's really the transformative value uh, that corporate explorers can bring to an existing corporation, uh, which, you know, can easily get um, uh, dismissed and, and is completely devalued by the folks who argue that you can just spin these ventures out. And that was never Vince's intention. He, he could spin out all kinds of uh, innovation from this amazingly innovative firm. But that wasn't the point for him. The point was, how do I transform this to be a new kind of semiconductor company, a new kind of technology company, which is much more interested in how we answer tough problems than how we just simply ship circuits. While we're speaking of leadership, one of the important aspects you talk about in the book is having one as a manifesto, but also having, and Mike touched on this before, having a, a really well-crafted strategic ambition because what that acts as is like a, a north star for the corporate explorer to kind of go, okay, where where is our hunting ground? Where can we play? What what arenas are we in? That Reza McGrath would say, where, where is our arena where we can actually 
use our skills and build new capabilities or else use capabilities we already have in new ways. This is a really, really important aspect because, again, leaders might think about vision being something that we tell outside the business. This is nice to have on your corporate website, but actually it can really inspire people within the organization. That's right. And and let's contrast this, right? So on one side, you have what I term the innovation zoo or what others uh, talk about as innovation theater. In other words, corporations who spend a lot of time generating ideas, involving people, but strangely, nothing quite ever happens as a result of those things, right? And, and, and then the other side is, Let's have a clear ambition of what we want to achieve in the market, like the wage of war on cash or um, Vince's we're going to move up the stack um, to capture more value. Um, th- these ambitions for the firm create a license. And particularly if you then say, what are my hunting zones? Where am I going to go and seek opportunity um, in order to realize that ambition? Uh, for Vince, it was in solving problems in you know, manufacturing, in healthcare, and so on, uh, he defined some areas where they were going to realize this ambition. And that creates some boundaries within which people, um, uh, explorers, can come up with the ideas, come up with the propositions, the proposals um, for, um, for how to, um, to you know, build a new venture. It, it, over in the Innovation Zoo, it's all bottom up. It's all you know, fun and games. But what, what's hidden within that is it's also safe, right? Because nothing's ever going to come out of the zoo. Therefore, we don't. We can just enjoy it. We don't have to deal with the consequences of a great idea. On the other side, you are committing yourself to the tough moments when you've got to say, yes, I'm going to commit millions of dollars or uh, euro to this venture, right? And also the equally serious moments when we're going to say, I'm sorry, Aiden, that was a great uh, project, but actually we're going to cut it off now because it's not working, right? These moments of consequence come when you're focused around an ambition and a hunting zone. And if you're just doing idea stuff, it it almost never comes to fruition. The idea of a manifesto is also something that you don't often hear about in the innovation arena, but also can inspire people. Yeah, well, so um, we... We have the great fortune uh, as a as a firm, Change Logic, of working with a lot of CEOs and senior teams, and they would talk about how do we get our people excited and interested in what we want to achieve, right? Um, and and with like, well, do they know what you want? Can they understand your strategy? Well, yeah, if they are willing to spend the time reading a hundred PowerPoint charts and imagining what all that gobbledygook actually means. And instead, what a manifesto does is it converts your strategy into a simple story. That's in three, four pages of text. Let's just tell the story of where we are, what we want to achieve, what it looks like when we get there, and what your role is in taking us to it. And and convert that sort of ambition like the wage of war on cash into something people can grab hold of and go do. Uh, and that that's the that's the work of a manifesto. And to be fair, it has value beyond your exploration agenda. It also has value in your in your core business uh, as well. And in our new book, the Corporate Explorer Field Book, we actually have a chapter about how to write an, a, 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 a manifesto that that I wrote with um, one of our client CEOs. Um, and and so you know we'll we'll, we'll look forward to seeing more manifestos uh, out, out of the world. I want to remind our audience as well that you can win a copy of the Corporate Explorer. Just sign up to the innovationshow.io newsletter. We're on Substack as well, and you'll be in the hat to win a copy. The Corporate Explorer field book comes out in August in the US and a little bit later over this side of the world, but it's a fabulous read. But I thought we'd talk next about the disciplines of innovation, ideation, incubation, and scaling. One of the big things I find in my own work in innovation is that everything tilts towards ideation because it's the exciting stuff. People love it. The post-it notes all over the place. There's tons and tons of material on how to ideate. There's different ways of how to do it. It engages the entire organization. 
but it kind of links sometimes to what you talked about there the innovation theater it doesn't go anywhere and really valuable innovation is stuff that you actually commercialize at the end of the day that you've brought the whole way through these three dis- di- disciplines ideation incubation and scaling and maybe I'll tee you up a little bit for ideation because one of the first things I ask and it, and clients don't often like when you say this is go, okay, well, what's the boundary or the constraint around the innovation that you want us to look at? Where is the hunting zone you want us to look at? And they straight away kind of go, innovation is supposed to be fun. Stop putting rules on it. <laughs> but it's so important. So I'm going to share here and Andy's going to speak to a diagram from the book for those who are watching us on youtube and andy maybe for those who aren't watching us on youtube we can be have a little bit of empathy and describe what's going on here absolutely so ideation incubation and scaling so ideation uh is really all about identifying important customer problems and developing ideas on how to solve them it is not starting with an idea and then trying to find somebody who needs it, right? Which is actually the dominant view of innovation. And if you go to uh, some of uh, Mike Tushman's colleagues um, at Harvard, I won't name them, and ask them about innovation, they will say that the quality of your innovation is directly linked to the number of ideas you generate and your ability to have lots of ideas will generate one good idea. And there's a there's a common sense to this, right? That this is the way that innovation works. The trouble is that the facts are extremely shaky. And that actually what in a corporate environment, what happens is the more ideas you generate, the more churn there is, the more difficulty there is um, to figure out which one of these ideas are good. Uh, and, and, and so in a high consensus, let's maximize comfort kind of world, what we end up doing is, is kind of trying to come up with a solution to the social problem of how do I deal with all these people with great ideas? Or we'll give them just a little bit of money and you never select the ones that matter. Right. And so we undermine the very purpose uh, that we might have stated at the beginning of any innovation project. A much better way of going about this is to say, well, what kind of ideas are we interested in? Where do we believe the maximum areas of opportunity might lie? And then how will we know um, that we found one that is worth our um, time, attention and resources to pursue? Uh, and so part of it is, uh, um, knowing your hunting zones. Part of it then is having some clear criteria for selection and then doing this, this in-depth work on understanding the, uh, the customer's problems. So one of the projects we did for an ins- insurance firm wanting to create uh, a, um, uh, a healthcare uh, business uh, was to go study um uh, the, 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 their two initial hunting zones were the world of get healthy and stay healthy, right? Okay, you'll get healthy, stay healthy, a little broad, but at least we know a little bit about what you're interested in too. And then, well, what's the patient's journey through get healthy and stay healthy? And what in that path are places where they have problems? Well, it turns out there's a big problem um, with access to primary care, right? And that's true globally, right? Um, so how could we increase access to primary health care? And oh, this uh, issue of mental health, um, this is a major focus for many people. Uh, and um, there is a limit to uh, both, both social stigma and then access to, to mental health. Well, these are two places. And oh, elderly care, uh, you know, not so much getting access to elderly care, but actually the pain of children having to figure out what to do with their uh, with their parents uh, as they age uh, and maybe move into a point of needing care when they don't want to go, right? And how do we how do we solve that problem? So so our, our big wide lens came down to three main areas of problems which they've now built businesses around. Right? And so that sort of translation of, uh, of a market opportunity into hunting zones, into customer problems to solve. Now, then there's a big problem of ideation. Right? Then you do need ideas. Okay, so how are we going to solve mental health? What are all the different ways we can solve this uh, particular problem? 
uh, and uh, how might we also build a business on this? That's the place where the diversity of ideas and input is needed. But you've 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 narrowed so much by that point that the ideas that you're working on are much more applicable and much more likely um, to be taken forward. Right? So that's ideation. Incubation uh, admits that well, that's a great idea, Aiden. Thank you very much. But uh, let's go find out if you're right, and can we subject um, this idea to some hypothesis testing, right? And to do small scale experiments to find out, firstly, just have we understood the customer problem accurately? Secondly, is our solution one that they're willing to consider? Does it generate enough value? Does it solve the job to be done? I know you did this um, uh, 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 um, series on Clay Christensen, and you know Clay or Tony Olwick would talk about the job to be done, right? Uh, and so uh, that's what you're testing. Have you properly understood the job to be done, and do you have a solution to that in a way that the customer finds uh, compelling, delightful? Um, and then do you understand the go to market? Do you uh, understand how to get it in their hands and, and what the ecosystem around adopting that product might be? I don't know if you've, uh, if you've done uh, any uh, series on, on the, the work of um, um, uh, the Tuck professor whose name is temporarily. Oh, Ron, a Ron Adner. Ron Adner. Yeah. Ron Adner. Yeah. 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 So Ron. Ron's uh, work on a wide lens. This is fantastic stuff. And what Ron talks about is the need for understanding your adoption chain. What are the different steps that a product goes through in order to be used in a particular market? Mostly when you come up with an idea, you don't know what that is, right? And Ron in his book tells the, the scary story of Pfizer's uh, investment in uh, inhalable insulin and the fact that they miss a key adoption step um, in terms of um, the availability of breath testing equipment in doctors who would be prescribing uh, insulin to diabetics. And this, this costs them a billion dollars of R&D that they didn't understand this adoption step. So this is the sort of thing that experimentation does, patiently testing your hypotheses. As Balaji Bondili says, what needs to be true in order for my business to be accurate, to, for me to be right? And can I go test each of these statements when it doesn't cost me very much? This should be cheap. This is not about uh, investing large sums of money. This is about lean uh, and being very careful uh, and structured uh, in how you do this. And then once you've validated all of those assumptions, scaling. And scaling is about bringing the customer access, the capabilities, the capacity to convert that business into a multi-million dollar revenue generating business. And that's really the point at which this amber dexterity thing becomes critical because, as I said before, you've got to create a separate unit. Um, you need to figure out how to access the core assets of the business appropriately. You need to have the right leadership and leadership team around it and so on. And so ideate, incubate, scale. These are three um, different but interrelated disciplines uh, of innovation. To make this concrete for people, and it's often useful to look at something that's existing that they have their head around. But when you actually kind of go right back to the people who are building that product to see what kind of hypotheses they had to face, it's really, really interesting. And one of the ones you do this with, and this teased to the idea of what you were saying about Rod Adner and also Balaji and testing out different hypotheses, it's really useful to look at the business model of Uber because there were so many moving parts there and they had to decide, okay, where do we start? And this can be often a, a place many people just become overwhelmed and they just go, oh, I could, <laughs> there's too much to do, I won't do it. But you've got to start somewhere. And I'm going to share here on the screen the Uber original business model for people to get their head around. Yeah, think about this um, this way, right? That um, they they you know, Uber when it starts has lots of different um, assumptions that its business is based on, um, and you know, some of the the ones that are sort of most um, uh, eye catching, like the the app. And the payment via the app, which is certainly a feature that I love that I don't have to worry about, you know, cash in 
in, in foreign currencies when I'm traveling uh, around uh, and so on. They turn out to be not vital to whether the idea will work, right? When you think about the importance of some of those assumptions, the really critical ones are that can a driver find a rider and will the riders book? And so it's just that fundamental transaction. And, and, and what, what, what we find is that, that Uber actually tests this first, right? And the initial app doesn't take payments. Actually, they take the credit cards by the phone, right? Um, and that they, uh, they use their own fleet of drivers. They don't have the marketplace of drivers that for which they become famous at first. They just validate that drivers can find the riders and that the riders will book. Those are the critical assumptions that they need to test. And those are the ones that they first subject to an experiment. And that's the same for any corporate explorer. You know, look for what are the really critical assumptions, what needs to be true in order for you to be able to advance. And then, then yeah, let's move on. Once you've established that, then you need to move on to the next set of assumptions uh, and uh, and to get um, uh, to move it on. And, and and importantly, some things don't can't be subjected to uh, experimentation like regulatory approval. I have another uh, client who's getting FDA approval for their innovation. They've had to go through testing all of the other assumptions, but they know that uh, the FDA approval is, a, is is something high level of uncertainty. But you know, in order to prove out what they're going to do, it doesn't matter in the initial phases. It, it's a later uh, uh, step. So you've got to kind of pass out which ones you're going to test at which points. I, I would say one other thing about this, uh, Aiden, which is that it turns out that the task of creating a hypothesis is really hard inside a corporate environment. And it's hard because um, of two things. Firstly, it uh, is premised on your ability to say, I don't know. I don't know how Uber will develop a successful business model. I'm going to have all of these assumptions and I'm going to test out and find out if I'm right. Most corporate managers do not get rewarded for the statement, I don't know, right? And so one of the most important things that any leader can do in order to support their innovators inside their organization is make it okay to talk about what you don't know and how you can use data to, to validate what you think might be the case, or indeed learn that you're wrong and you move on to something uh, uh, more cheaply. So that's the, 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 uh, the first thing. The second thing is that um, managers, uh, I find, are remarkably reluctant to put it out there, to actually state confidently, here's what I think might be the case. Here's my point of view about why this business model will work. They hope that somehow uh, the more they get into it, it'll kind of sort itself out. This is a really, and this is, this is about the corporate explorer. This is not about leadership or anything like that. This is just about the corporate explorer. You've got to be ready to put it out there. What do you think it's going to take for this idea to work so that you can subject it to test? And the thing is that if you do the tests when the stakes are low, you get to learn, you get to change it, and you get to find out if you're right. Uh, and so this is the, one of the most important disciplines that you can uh, you can learn to adopt. It's so important what you said there about both the leader understanding that you almost fail your way towards success. That's how most ideas are discovered or uncovered. But also, it's the role of the corporate explorer. And this is where so many of us are couldn't be bothered with the politics of the organization. But Unfortunately, it's a core aspect of success is actually managing the politics, managing the message, managing the story, but also educating teams. It's one of the reasons I got into L&D and actually into teaching this is because I had to teach it within the organization to help people get over the initial inertia, but also fear and really just lack of understanding because it's a different world and it needs different metrics. And therefore, the corporate explorer needs to be the educator of that to leadership teams. And there's ways you can do that. I'd love you to share these, Andy. Yeah, no, I think that's really well said, uh, Aiden, is that the, the, the corporate explorer needs to be the educator, right? 
Um, and and my 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 favourite story of this is back to Christian Curtis at uh, at Unica. And you know, Christian um, develops his idea. He's as I say, he, he says, um, you know, uh, the insurance industry is broken. It needs to re uh, connect with this notion of community. And and he says he asks himself, what would Spotify do? The online uh, streaming music streaming service. And he says, well, they'd make it on a monthly subscription. They'd make it all digital. They would have outstanding customer service. Uh, and they'd pay claims in two days. And then he adds the community dimension, which is that um, some portion of the profits um, of this new product can be redistributed to good causes, um, to community groups, so that it's, you know, it's back to this risk sharing community, right? And he takes the idea after he's done all of the social network that we talked about and the winning support, he gets in front of the senior team and the CEO. And the CEO is like, wow, if we don't do this and somebody else does, we're finished. You know, this is like, this is like really a problem for us. Um, and, and he says, well, look, here's, here's 5 million euro to, to, to go build it. And Christian's like, no, 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 no. I don't want the money. I don't want the money. I want a little bit of money. And I'm going to go test and find out if I'm right. right. And so he taught his CEO and his senior team how to deal with this um, learning in small increments. And, and in this case, I joined the story. Um, and so I, I saw this happening right, personally, where um, a, a, a Andy Brandstetter, the CEO of Unica, was, who, who's a, who's uh, uh, like uh, Vince Roche, a phenomenal CEO, really successful. Um, but but Andreas had had built Unica. Um, uh, it, he he built this international division through acquisition. He'd rolled up a series of small Central Eastern European insurance companies uh, and sort of built this new division for the company. And this was different. This was the world of doing things part, you know, at least partially organically. And in that world, he had to learn how to test and learn his, uh, his value propositions. And this was, this was, you know, fortunately, uh, and he's very open to learning, just as Vince Roche is. And so they were able to adapt to being able to, to receive the lesson. Um, but it, it is a vital thing to do. And of course, one of the things, and you mentioned this, is that you've got to learn to, to, to adopt new metrics. Right. You cannot hold a new uncertain venture accountable for hitting a revenue number until it's ready. Then, by all means, you're going to do that. But at first, what you've got to say is, OK, so what are your milestones? What's the point at which you validated the business model? Uh, how many customers do you expect to get in a year? Um, how many pilot installations do you ha have? And they'll be idiosyncratic to the individual venture, what milestones you have. And they should be accountable. This is another one of those terrible things that people do is say, well, innovation, it, it should just be let to go and do whatever it wants to. It shouldn't be accountable for anything. This is a major problem because at some point, the core business is going to turn around and say, well, what are you doing with my money? Right. Um, and, and you've got to be able to answer that and be really clear about what you've achieved and what metrics you are using in order to measure progress. It's just they're different metrics. They're metrics that tell you about what's your progress towards your ambition rather than those that are looking at past historic performance. And so this is the kind of thing that, that Christian Curtis taught his CEO, that Balaji Bondili has taught um, the, uh, the leadership at Deloitte, how to use metrics that indicate a path to the future rather than simply uh, those that tell you about what happened in the past. And, and these are the things, Andy, that we we as corporate explorers think the idea is going to do the job oh the idea is so good it's so revolutionary and the idea never does the job you got to do so much preparatory work because executive attention is such a scarce resource you say for example vince roach again this is ideal scenario he meets with the team every four to six weeks exploring what's going on with the corporate explorers but also includes the cfo which is so important but also he teaches the corporate explorer how to manage the corporate system because that is the heart it's like snakes and ladders you think you've got a meeting you think it's going to be great all of a sudden somebody absolutely fillets you in that meeting 
And it's so demoralizing. And many corporate explorers just leave the organization at that stage or after a few of those. And it's the corporate immune system doing its job because it's core based. It's like I'm doing my job by protecting the organization and our existing revenue streams, not squandering money on this innovation crap with you guys sitting on your beanbags, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, there is this almost translation role that's played by people like Vince Roach. But this is really rare. Maybe you'll give us, there's a lot in this, but maybe some ideas of how to do this as the CEO, but also how to manage it as the corporate explorer. I would say a couple of things. Um, One of them is that we partially have to let go of the notion that there's bad intentions here. Right. Um, the, 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 I was in a conference last year where this academic, um, talked about there being saboteurs in the organization. Right. And maybe there are, but that's not the point. Mostly that, um, uh, intent from the core business leader to say, what are you doing with my money is entirely rational. They are set up, they're motivated. They are uh, organized around driving efficiency, driving performance in a business that has been going for, you know, in the case of Unica, 200 years as the firm founded uh, when uh, Beethoven was writing symphonies in Vienna. Right. So this is this is an old firm. And so that that power of performance uh, is is valid and real. And so when they ask a new venture, well, what are you doing? They're doing so with rationality. It's a reasonable thing for them to do. And what we need to get to understand is there's just, there are just different logics at work, right? So that's first thing to, to, that's important to not, not allow, um, the relationships become personal, antagonistic, uh, bad intention, because it's, 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 it, you're misunderstanding something really important if you go down that road. And many corporate explorers can't help themselves, um, but go down that road. The second thing I I would say, which sounds at some level contradictory, is you've got to create some tension. I was in a, uh, I was called in by a client. I hadn't spoken to the client in three months. Um, uh, We're going to um, have uh, a final board approval uh, for our new venture team. And I'd like you to join Andy and talk about what other firms have done on this. And so, uh, okay, I can do that for you. Um, so I do. And uh, the board is silent. They have no questions. What does that mean? Okay. It means they have no intention of backing this new venture. Right? There's no tension in the discussion. There's no real issues being put on the table in a way that allows the corporate explorer to, to deal with the objections that they might have. So you know, in that instance, I'm, I'm virtual and they're all in a room. I had no opportunity to, 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 to do this. But had I been, I would have put that on the table. You're all silent. It suggests to me that there are issues you're not willing to talk about. You know, would you care to share? Okay. For example, you might be concerned about whether you're signing a blank check um, that will um, deliver nothing without any accountability. Let's address accountability in the room, right? Um, uh, uh, I'm concerned that actually, um, you know, we we are stepping into a world that we don't understand uh, and spending money on a pipe dream rather than something that's grounded in reality. Let's talk about that and address it. So you've got to raise the tension in the conversation and invite comment, invite um, uh, people to to talk to you about their concerns. Otherwise, you're in a fake world. You're in just in this sort of shadow world in which maybe you get through the first round and you get, you know, the CEO manages to get some support. But, you know, I, I've uh, I've had the privilege of working with CEOs for I don't know, 30, 40 years now. And, and one of the realities is that they are only one person in an organization. And yeah, if you're in a founder-led organization, sometimes they have more power and influence. But mostly, they are just one person. And they have limits to their power. So you've got to bring people with you. You've got to win other stakeholders over. And and you've got to have lots of uh, situations in which it's possible to attend to the rational concerns that they have, the rational objections that they have, not just 
to winning the support of the CEO alone. And again, I have so much empathy. I know how difficult that is for the corporate explorer because you're you just want to build the thing. You want to build, you want to get it over the line, and you've it's like it's like doing really well in the computer game and getting to so many levels, and then you have this boss that you need to defeat, and you're like kind of going, I don't know if I can do this anymore because it does take so much resilience to get all the way through, and it is so political. And that is against so many of the skills that the corporate explorer has because you're creative, you're curious, and you're not political. And this can be really, really difficult. I thought a great story to share, a cautionary tale, was the story of GE, General Electric, succumbing to the allure of the present. So I'll, I'll maybe I'll tee up here with how the story ends. So in June 2018, Rue's boss, I'll tell you, you can maybe fill in the gaps here of who this person is. CEO Jeffrey Immelt was gone. GE was dropped from the Dow Jones Industrial Average, where it had been a member since the index's founding in 1907. With GE's new CEO, Ruse Digital Units, budget was cut by a quarter. Staff were laid off at its Silicon Valley labs, and later it would be wound up. Ruse's story illustrates how mature, successful businesses become tuned to exploit an existing business model, not explore new ones. The core business system, so successful at driving performance and profit, becomes, as you called it, a silent killer of the new venture. This happens all the time. We're seeing it today in a, a lot of cases because of inflation, because of changes in the business world. We're going to see it more and more. This tale is both cautionary for you, the CEO, who sees the innovation and perhaps new business ventures as a distraction, but also for the corporate explorer to know how to position the business venture to be able to succeed in the future. Over to you, Andy. Yeah. So what what Imelt does is he succumbs to the um, pathology of investing ahead of learning, is that he sees the uh, opportunity to build a new venture that um, will add technology to manufacturing and um, realize this industrial internet of things. He starts this in like 2012 uh, and he appoints uh, this uh, guy from uh, Bill Rue from Cisco uh, from the outside um, to lead the venture. And uh, he is so confident of its success that after two years, he has uh, a Harvard Business School case written about how clever it is. This is a lead indicator of failure in a in new venture creation, right? Because he has put his his uh, he's making the assumption that this is working well ahead of um, the reality of the market. And of course, here we are you know, over 10 years later, and the market for the industrial internet of things is just about starting to get established. He's a decade ahead, right? And all of that could have been learned before he got there, right? So there's part of this story is about the pathology of the CEO. The other part is what happens to Bill Roo. Uh, and Bill Roo gets very cleverly, systematically, and I think logically and rationally, not, not again, by saboteurs, uh, undermined um, by the rest of the business. Uh, they make sure that although he has this GE digital unit, it doesn't have revenue. It credits all of its revenue through the existing business unit. So it's not really an ambidextrous business in the way that Mike Charles and I mean at all. It's, it's really just an overlay. And I should say there's an editing error in the book. Um, it's not the unit that gets wound up. It's the strategy, right? Uh, and, and so there is still a GE Digital. And I'm sure it does fine work. But the strategy um, to be a top 10 software company gets killed and all the resources associated with this because this is what he was after. He was after this ambition to really transform GE uh, into a data-led software business uh, and to transform manufacturing. And, and it's the... Um, the way in which he then has to rely on people whose jobs are tied entirely to the current business 
and whose competencies are much more aligned to finance and managing the existing business than they are to the digital world that he's trying to create. So this is the classic case of silent killers of a strategy, right? Um, of um, the professional identity of GE being much more about finance, much more about managing the status quo, that this optimization to the short term, driving revenue to the business units, not to the new venture. So it doesn't have the ability to create its own sort of power base in the organization, if you will. And then thirdly, um, that um, uh, Imelt himself keeps peace in the senior team by saying, oh, don't worry. Uh, yes, I'll have it here at a corporate level, but don't worry, you'll retain all the power. You know, he basically undermines his own innovation. And he talks about it later uh, in his own book uh, as being that he he misunderstood the cultural norms of the digital world. He didn't realize how different they were from the industrial. And this is this is why you need to separate out the new business from the existing. Right? You've got to create some separation. You cannot do this if you try and make it everybody's job to work towards the future. It just gets killed. It, the human brain and the organization are not capable of living in these two separate modes simultaneously. And, and GE is a, is a sad, sad tale. And, and, and let me tell you, oh, by the way, GE spent about as much money as you can on lean startup, design thinking, and all of the methodologies that you can name. And they were expert at all of this stuff. And it didn't make any difference because these fundamental structural leadership and cultural barriers remained. And this is why it's so important to understand that corporate innovation is yes about lean startup, design thinking, which are really important methodologies, but it's always about change. It's always about shifting that organization as well. Okay. Okay. So you're a leader. You're listening. You're going to go and you know what? Bins, I'm just going to buy myself a company. I'm just going to reverse it into our, my organization and buy that capability. Well, you've thought about that as well. There's a report by Morgan Stanley that concluded that the return on investment in venture capital funds in the 21st century is broadly in line with those of other major stock market indices, despite the fact that higher risks are associated with funding startups. Larger acquisitions faced even higher odds of failure. One study found that 60% of acquisitions destroy current shareholder value. Another found that 83% of acquisitions fail to achieve their objectives. The ac academic consensus is that corporate acquisitions on average fail and the value of write-offs exceeds gains by a wide margin your recommendation is that corporate explorers have a plan for combining assets from different sources to take a new venture to scale acquire with a purpose not as a shortcut to success the re the reason i say that is you mentioned there about there needs to be some separation but I wanted to, to emphasize that this does not mean a corporate outpost somewhere else. What your consensus is, along with Mike and with Charles, is that one feeds the other. The, the past feeds the future and the future feeds the past. They become this kind of entity, this ambidextrous organization that has two modes of being, but still are part of the same overall being. That's an important aspect. I'd love you to take us through this. Again, I've thrown a lot at you. It's early morning for you, but I'd love you to share this. So, Aiden, this is like a really important point. And uh, I would say, yeah, any CEOs listening, but also anybody in strategy or um, uh, particularly this, this, this point particularly uh, 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 tends to offend people in corporate venture capital a great deal. Um, be, because I think we've got this completely wrong, right? Um, there is this strong separation in the world between M and A and uh, and venture building, as if these are two completely different activities, right? Instead of thinking them as two useful disciplines on the path to new growth, right? And that if you are want to follow an ambition like the wager war on cash from 
from um, Ajay Banga or Vince Roche's uh, move up the stack and capture value and solve customer problems, then your answer is going to be a both, right? And you're going to get there by combining assets uh, in different ways. So I'm not against uh, acquisition. What I'm what I'm saying is, and 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 incidentally, if you acquire near peers, ones that you can easily uh, absorb, and they they round out your product portfolio, that that that's one type of innovation, uh, one type of acquisition, which is also subject to some of those same problems um, of of integration. But it's not really what we're talking about. What we're talking about is acquiring new capabilities. And when you're acquiring new capabilities, you just go buy something new that you don't understand. You have no ability to manage, right? Um, and you you are left wondering how to go to market. You know, it can work. But as you point out, the risks are extremely high. And they're, and they're much higher than uh, the new venture, in fact. And so a much better way to think about this is to use your corporate explorers and your new ventures uh, as a way to learn of the market opportunity. And then once you've incubated it, yes, build around it capabilities, some of which you'll build, some of which you'll leverage from the core, and some of which you'll acquire. And this story of uh, Best Buy Health is a fantastic example of exactly this, because they leverage the, the brand of Best Buy that reassures customers. They leverage the Best Buy store network. They leverage the Geek Squad, um, uh, the home installation team. But then they acquire um, a, 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 um, a call center team, a great call that does the elderly at home assistance. They acquire this um, uh, software platform um, uh, which I can't remember the name of now, right now, which, which essentially connects hospitals to the home, right? Um, and so they've, they, they solve a problem for the industry by being able to realize the ambition to have people cared for in their own home with remote diagnostics, right? And, and so this is by leveraging assets, by building stuff, but by a lot of acquisitions, right? And so it's the combination towards an ambition is what we're talking about here. Uh, and that is a much surer way to enter a new market than this, you know, hoping that the business you buy works out. Because anybody who's worked inside corporations or served corporations, as I have as a consultant, know the stories of buying small startup companies for, you know, tuck-in acquisitions, we'll call them. And you know that in reality, the, most of the time, the acquisition cases don't pan out because once you lift the hood on some of these um, uh, startups, uh, actually, they are not as advanced or mature as you thought they were. And they haven't solved the problems of scaling and they're really hoping you can, right? And I think this is where uh, corporations need to step up and to use corporations to uh, to use startups rather, use acquisitions to fulfill their own ambitions rather than hoping that they're fulfilling the ambitions of the startup ventures. I have a lovely final quote that I wanted to share, but a couple of things first is, why on earth would you want to be a corporate explorer when it's so difficult? And again, so many people who listen to this show and watch this show ask themselves that every day <laughs> and they, yet they still do it they still love the dopamine hit that you get from it that's one major question i have for you and maybe before we even go there i'll share my final quote and then i'll hand over to you but where can people find you because you mentioned their your work several times andy what are you doing now where can people find you to engage you etc so um you can find me at uh, uh, changelogic.com uh, uh, and find me on LinkedIn, Andrew JM Bins, uh, and uh, very happy to to hear from any of your listeners, and love to get feedback on those who buy the book, uh, Corporate Explorer, um, uh, or the new book, Corporate Explorer Field Book. And for those people who aren't on LinkedIn, I'm always on LinkedIn sharing excerpts from shows. I'll link to Andy as well from those little excerpts that I'd share there also so my final quote I, I absolutely love this line and then i'm going to hand to you which is the question why be an, a corporate explorer you say becoming a corporate explorer is not a route to safe or easy corporate career 
Those that accept the role have chosen to stand out from the crowd, break the rules and defy the usual corporate career ladder. However, in an uncertain world in which corporation career paths are less structured, the certainties of advancement have become less secure. The capabilities of the corporate explorer to manage uncertainty and mobilize an organization around them may be increasingly in demand. Paradoxically, stepping into Heraclitus's river may be the best way to secure a future for a company and corporate explorer alike. Absolutely love that, Andy. What about you? Why become a corporate explorer? You know, um, one of the things about corporate explorers is that very few of them are given the job. They take it. They are not people who are waiting around doing the job and then say, hey, Aiden, it's time to be a corporate explorer. They, 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 there's something in them that drives them forward. When you talk to Balaji, Balaji will talk about the moment at which he got involved in supporting the, um, what we would call Boxing Day tsunami, uh, in whatever that was, 2008, uh, seven, eight, something like that. And, and he was involved in crowdsourcing support to the, um, to Southeast Asia during that crisis, right? And he thought, wait a minute, there's something in this that's new, that's different. Um, that if we could crowdsource labor for this crisis, maybe I wouldn't have to get on the plane every week as a consultant. Maybe we could be using, uh, crowdsource talent to do some of this work instead, right? And, and so it proceeds from this, this, this passion, this moment, this observation, but they face a choice. And the choice is, do you take this innovation inside the corporation or do you go outside and try to find venture capital to, to back you? And in most of the cases, they have that alternative. Certainly, Christian Kurtish at Unica had VC firms ready to back him. Uh, Yoki Matsuoka at Panasonic, um, she was one of the founders of Nest, the, um, the, 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 the thermostat, the Google Nest now, right? And so she definitely knows VCs, right? So they have this alternative. And the question, well, why would they do this? Especially given all of these troubles, the silent killers, the lack of compensation, you know, why would you do this? Well, it's, it's for a couple of reasons. Firstly, um, because of this reality that most ventures scale through using corporate assets, be that a corporate innovation or be that a startup. Right. Most startups get acquired by corporates and they hope like hell that the corporates know how to scale their venture. That is the reality. And so to some degree, they look at this. Well, I can get this done faster. Uh, Christian Kurtish can leverage the actuaries to design the products. They've got insurance licenses. They've got scale across Europe. Right. They've got um, uh, reinsurance capabilities. He's got all of these things ready to deploy. And so there is just that asset. But there's something else which is a little bit less sort of um, factual, practical. It, there's a little bit of an emotional connection. They're a part of something. They're a part of a community. They're a part of a company. And actually, they want to do this in their company. They, they, they believe in the mission, the ambition of the firm. And they are realizing their view of how that could come to life. And so there is a, a mission driven quality to uh, the work that a lot of these people do. And they want to see the overall corporation transform. And, you know, and that's, that, that sometimes is the payoff. And the reward often comes later in career as they become CEOs, uh, as they advance in the firm, because this is the key attribute of a leader that you don't wait to be told. You take ownership. And you take the responsibility for making this work and you build the support of others around you. There's this great uh, uh, moment in uh, the uh, TV series, the, the West Wing, where um, uh, the president asks, um, you know, so what do you ask somebody? Um, what do you ask? What do you call uh, a leader that nobody follows? Someone going for a walk. Right? And what's the point of that? Right? And so they want to build support and followership around them. And that's the definition of a leader. And I th think that's what corporate explorers are. And I think it's why you should step into being a corporate explorer. And I think it's why corporations should encourage and enable them to step forward and be successful. Sounds like a manifesto to me, Andy. Author of The Corporate Explorer, 
how corporations beat startups at the innovation game. Andrew Bins, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Aiden. The Innovation Show is proudly sponsored by Gate One. Gate One have offices here in Dublin, in New York, and in London, and work with the world's leading organizations to drive meaningful change. You can find Gate One at gateoneconsulting.com.